The Beast of Everoin 1. The Deposition of Brother Jérôme I, a poor scrivener and the humblest monk of the Benedictine Abbey of Perigon, have been asked by our abbot Théophile to write down this record of a strange evil that is still rampant, still unquelled, and, ere I have done writing, it may be that the evil shall come forth again from its lurking place, and again be manifest. We, the friars of Perigon, and all others who have knowledge of this thing, agree that its advent was coeval with the first rising of the red comet which still burns nightly, a flying balefire above the moonless hills, like Satan's rutilant hair, trailing on the wind of Gehenna as he hastens worldward. It rose below the dragon in early summer, and now it follows the scorpion toward the western woods. Some say that the horror came from the comet, flying without wings to earth across the stars. And truly, before this summer of 1369, and the lifting of that red disastrous scourge upon the heavens, there was no rumor or legend of such a thing in all Averroin. As for me, I must deem that the beast is a spawn of the seventh hell, a foulness born of the bubbling, flame-blent ooze, for it has no likeness to the beasts of earth, to the creatures of air and water, and the comet may well have been the fiery vehicle of its coming. To me, for my sins and unworthiness, was it first given to behold the beast. Surely the sight thereof was a warning of those ways which lead to perdition, for on that occasion I had broken the rule of St. Benedict which forbids eating during a one day's errand away from the monastery. I had tarried late, after bearing a letter from Théophile to the good priest of St. Zenobie, though I should have been back well before evensong, and also apart from eating. I had drunk the mellow white wine of St. Zenobie with its kindly people. Doubtless because I had done these things, I met the nameless, night-born terror in the woods behind the abbey when I returned. The day had vanished, fading unaware, and the long summer eve, without moon, had thickened to a still and eldritch darkness ere I approached the abbey postern, and hurrying along the forest path, I felt an eerie fear of the gnarled hunchback oaks and their pit-deep shadows, and when I saw between their antic boughs the vengefully streaming fire of the new comet, which seemed to pursue me as I went, the goodly warmth of the wine died out, and I began to regret my truancy, for I knew that the comet was a harbinger of ill, an omen of death and satanry to come. Now. As I passed among the ancient trees that tower thickly, growing toward the postern, I thought that I beheld a light from one of the abbey windows and was much cheered thereby. But going on, I saw that the light was near at hand, beneath a lowering bough beside my path, and moreover, it moved as with the flitting of a restless fen-fire, and was wholly dissimilar to the honest glow of a lamp, lantern, or taper and the light was of changeable color, being pale as a corpuscent, or ruddy as new-spilled blood, or green as the poisonous distillation that surrounds the moon. Then, with ineffable terror, I beheld the thing to which the light clung like a hellish nimbus, moving as it moved, and revealing dimly the black abomination of head and limbs that were not those of any creature wrought by God. The horror stood erect, rising to the height of a tall man, and it moved with the swaying of a great serpent, and its members undulated as if they were boneless. The round black head, having no visible ears or hair, was thrust forward on a neck of snakish length, two eyes, small and lidless, glowing hotly as coals from a wizard's brazier were set low and near together in the noseless face above the serrate gleaming of bat-like teeth. This much I saw, and no more, ere the thing went past me with the strange nimbus flaring from venomous green to a wrathful red. Of its actual shape, 
and the number of its limbs, I could form no just notion. It uttered no sound, and its motion was altogether silent. Running and slithering rapidly, it disappeared in the bow-black night among the antique oaks, and I saw the hellish light no more. I was nigh dead with fear when I reached the abbey and sought admittance at the postern and the porter who came at last to admit me, after I had knocked many times, forbore to chide me for my tardiness when I told him of that which I had seen in the moonless wood. On the morrow, I was called before Théophile, who rebuked me sternly for my breach of discipline, and imposed a penance of day-long solitude. Being forbidden to hold speech with the others, I did not hear till the second morn of the thing that was found before Nones in the wood behind Perigon, where I had met the nameless beast. The thing was a great stag which had been slain in some ungodly fashion, not by wolf or hunter or poacher. It was unmarked by any wound, other than a wide gash that had laid bare the spine from neck to tail and the spine itself had been shattered, and the white marrow sucked therefrom. But no other portion of the stag had been devoured. None could surmise the nature of the beast that slew and ravened in such a manner. But many, for the first time, began to credit my tale, which the abbot and the brothers had hitherto looked upon as a sort of drunken dream. Verily, they said, a creature from the pit was abroad and this creature had killed the stag and had sucked the marrow from its broken spine. And I, aghast with the recollection of that loathly vision, marveled at the mercy of God, which had permitted me to escape the doom of the stag. None other, it seemed, had beheld the monster on that occasion, for all the monks, save me, had been asleep in the dormitory, and Théophile had retired early to his cell. But... During the nights that followed the slaying of the stag, the presence of this baleful thing was made manifest to all. Now, night by night, the comet greatened, burning like an evil mist of blood and fire, while the stars blenched before it and terror shadowed the thoughts of men. And in our prayers, from prime to evensong, we sought to deprecate the unknown ills which the comet would bring in its train. And day by day, from peasants, priests, woodcutters, and others who came to visit the abbey, we heard the tale of fearsome and mysterious depredations, similar in all ways to the killing of the stag. Dead wolves were found with their chines laid open and the spinal marrow gone, and an ox and a horse were treated in like fashion. Then, it would seem, the beast grew bolder or else it wearied of such humble prey as deer and wolves, horses and oxen. At first, it did not strike at living men, but assailed the helpless dead like some foul eater of carrion. Two freshly buried corpses were found lying in the cemetery at saint Zenobie, where the thing had dug them from their graves and had laid open their vertebrae. In each case, only a little of the marrow had been eaten. But as if in rage or disappointment, the cadavers had been torn into shreds from crown to heel, and the tatters of their flesh were mixed inextricably with the rags of their cerements. From this, it would seem that only the spinal marrow of creatures newly killed was pleasing to the monster. Thereafter the dead were not molested, but a grievous toll was taken from the living. On the night following the desecration of the graves, Two charcoal burners, who plied their trade in the forest at a distance of no more than a mile from Perigon, were slain foully in their hut. Other charcoal burners, dwelling nearby, heard the shrill screams that fell to sudden silence, and peering fearfully through the chinks of their bolted doors, they saw anon in the gray starlight the departure of a black, obscenely glowing shape that issued from the hut. Not till dawn did they dare to verify the fate of their hapless fellows, who, they then discovered, had been served in the same manner as the wolves and other victims of the beast. When the tale of this happening was brought to the abbey, Théophile called me before him 
and questioned me closely anent the apparition which I had encountered. He, like the others, had doubted me at first, deeming that I was frightened by a shadow or by some furtive creature of the wood. But, after the series of atrocious maraudings, it was plain to all that a fiendish thing such as had never been fabled in Averroin was abroad and ravening through the summer woods, and moreover it was plain that this thing was the same which I had beheld on the eve of my return from saint Zenubi. Our good abbot was greatly exercised over this evil, which had chosen to manifest itself in the neighborhood of the abbey, and whose depredations were all committed within a five hours' journey of Perigon, pale from his over-strict austerities and vigils. With hollow cheeks and burning eyes, Théophile called me before him and made me tell my story over and over, listening as one who flagellates himself for a fancied sin. And though I, like all others, was deeply sensible of this hellish horror and the scandal of its presence, I marveled somewhat at the godly wrath and indignation of our abbot, in whom blazed a martial ardor against the minions of Asmodai. Truly, he said, there is a great devil among us that has risen with the comet from Malibolge. We, the monks of Perigon, must go forth with cross and holy water to hunt the devil in its hidden lair, which lies haply at our very portals. So, on the afternoon of that same day, Théophile, together with myself and six others chosen for their hardihood, sallied forth from the abbey and made search of the mighty forest for miles around, entering with lifted crosses, by torchlight, the deep caves to which we came but finding no fiercer thing than wolf or badger. Also, we search the vaults of the ruined castle of Fosflamme, which is said to be haunted by vampires, but nowhere could we trace the sable monster, nor find any sign of its lairing. Since then, the middle summer has gone by with nightly deeds of terror beneath the blasting of the comet. Beasts, men, children, women— had been done to death by the monster, which, though seeming to haunt mainly the environs of the abbey, has ranged a field even to the shores of the river Isolil and the gates of La Frenée and Zimes, and some have beheld the monster at night, a black and slithering foulness clad in changeable luminescence, but no man has ever beheld it by day. Thrice has the horror been seen in the woods behind the abbey, and once, by full moonlight, a brother peering from his window descried it in the abbey garden, as it glided between the rows of peas and turnips, going toward the forest, and all agree that the thing is silent, uttering no sound, and is swifter in its motions than the weaving viper. Much have these occurrences preyed on our abbot, who keeps to his cell in unremitting prayer and vigil and comes forth no longer, as was his wont, to dine and hold converse with the guests of the abbey. Pale and meagre as a dying saint he grows, and a strange illness devours him, as if with perpetual fever, and he mortifies the flesh till he totters with weakness. And we others, living in the fear of God, and abhorring the deeds of Satan, can only pray that the unknown scourge be lifted from the land and pass with the passing of the comet. 2. The Letter of Théophile to Sister Thérèse To you, my sister in God, as well as by consanguinity, I must ease my mind, if this be possible, by writing again of the dread thing that harbors close to Périgon for this thing has struck once more within the abbey walls, coming in darkness and without sound or other ostent than the phlegathonian luster that surrounds its body and members. I have told you of the death of Brother Jérôme, slain at evening in his cell, while he was copying an Alexandrian manuscript. Now the fiend has become even bolder, for last night it entered the dormitory, where the brothers sleep in their robes, girded and ready to arise instantly, and without waking the others, 
on whom it must have cast a Lethean spell. It took Brother Augustine, slumbering on his pallet at the end of the row, and the fell deed was not discovered till daybreak, when the monk who slept nearest to Augustine awakened and saw his body, which lay face downward with the back of the robe and the flesh beneath a mass of bloody tatters. On this occasion, the beast was not beheld by anyone, but at other times, full often, it has been seen around the abbey, and its craftiness and hardihood are beyond belief, except as those of an arch-devil, and I know not where the horror will end, for exorcisms and the sprinkling of holy water at all doors and windows have failed to prevent the intrusion of the beast, and God and Christ and all the holy saints are deaf to our prayers. Of the terror laid upon Averroin by this thing, and the bale and mischief it has wrought outside the abbey, I need not tell, since all this will have come to you as a matter of common report. But here, at Perigon, there is much that I would not have rumored publicly, lest the good fame of the abbey should suffer. I deem it a humiliating thing, and a derogation and pollution of our sanctity that a foul fiend should have ingress to our walls unhindered and at will. There are strange whispers among the brothers, who believe that Satan himself has risen to haunt us. Several have met the beast even in the chapel, where it has left an unspeakably blasphemous sign of its presence. Bolts and locks are vain against it, and vain is the lifted cross to drive it away. It comes and goes at its own choosing and they who behold it flee in irrestrainable terror. None knows where it will strike next, and there are those among the brothers who believe it menaces me, the elected abbot of Berigon, since many have seen it gliding along the hall outside my cell, and Brother Constantine, the cellarer, who returned late from a visit to Vion not long ago swears that he saw it by moonlight as it climbed the wall toward that window of my cell which faces the great forest. And seeing Constantine, the thing dropped to the ground like a huge ape and vanished among the trees. All, it would seem, save me, had beheld the monster. And now, my sister, I must confess a strange thing, which above all else would attest the influential power of hell in this matter and the hovering of the wings of Asmodai about Perigon. Each night since the coming of the comet and the beast, I have retired early to my cell, with the intention of spending the nocturnal hours in vigil and prayer, as I am universally believed to do, and each night a stupor falls upon me as I kneel before the Christ on the silver crucifix, and oblivion steeps my senses in its poppy and I lie without dreams on the cold floor till dawn. Of that which goes on in the abbey I know nothing, and all the brothers might be done to death by the beast, and their spines broken and sucked, as is its invariable fashion, without my knowledge. Haircloth have I worn, and thorns and thistle burrs have I strewn on the floor to awake me from this evil and ineluctable slumber that is like the working of some orient drug. But the thorns and thistles are as a couch of paradisal ease, and I feel them not till dawn, and dim and confused are my senses when I awaken, and deep languor thralls my limbs, and day by day a lethal weakness grows upon me, which all ascribe to saintly pernoctations of prayer and austerity. Surely I have become the victim of a spell and am holden by a baleful enchantment while the beast is abroad with its hellish doings, heaven, in its inscrutable wisdom, punishing me for what sin I know not, has delivered me utterly to this bondage, and has thrust me down to the sloughs of a Stygian despair. Ever I am haunted by an eerie notion that the beast comes nightly to earth from the red comet which passes like a fiery wane above Averroin and by day it returns to the comet, having eaten its fill of that provender for which it seeks, and only with the comet's fading will the horror cease to harry the land and infest Perigon. But I know not if this thought is madness, 
or a whisper from the pit. Pray for me, Thérèse, in my bewitchment and my despair, for God has abandoned me, and the yoke of hell has somehow fallen upon me, and naught can I do to defend the Abbey from this evil, and I, in my turn, pray that such things may touch you not nor approach you in the quiet cloisters of the convent at Zimes. 3. The Story of Luc le Chaudronnier Old age, like a moth in some fading arras, will gnaw my memories over soon, as it gnaws the memories of all men. Therefore, I write this record of the true origin and slaying of that creature known as the Beast of Averroin, and when I have ended the writing, the record shall be sealed in a brazen box and that box be set in a secret chamber of my house at Zimes, so that no man shall learn the dreadful verity of this matter till many years and decades have gone by. Indeed, it were not well for such evil prodigies to be divulged while any who took part in the happening are still on the earthward side of purgatory. And at present the truth is known only to me and to certain others who are sworn to maintain secrecy. The ravages of the beast, however, are common knowledge, and have become a tale with which to frighten children. Men say that it slew fifty people, night by night, in the summer of 1369, devouring in each case the spinal marrow. It ranged mostly about the abbey of Perigon, and to Zimes, and saint Zenobi and La Frenay. Its nativity and lairing place were mysteries that none could unravel and church and state were alike powerless to curb its maraudings, so that a dire terror fell upon the land, and people went to and fro as in the shadow of death. From the very beginning, because of my own commerce with occult things and with the spirits of darkness, the baleful beast was the subject of my concern. I knew that it was no creature of earth or of the terrene hells, but had come with the flaming comet from ulterior space. But regarding its character and attributes and genesis, I could learn no more at first than any other. Vainly I consulted the stars and made use of geomancy and necromancy, and the familiars whom I interrogated professed themselves ignorant, saying that the beast was altogether alien and beyond the ken of sublunar devils. Then... I bethought me of the ring of Ibon, which I had inherited from my fathers, who were also wizards. The ring had come down, it was said, from ancient Hyperborea, and it was made of a redder gold than any that the earth yields in latter cycles, and was set with a great purple gem, somber and smoldering, whose like is no longer to be found, and in the gem an antique demon was held captive a spirit from pre-human worlds and ages, which would answer the interrogation of sorcerers. So, from a rarely opened casket, I brought out the ring of Ibon, and made such preparations as were needful for the questioning of the demon. And when the purple stone was held inverted above a small brazier filled with hotly burning amber, the demon made answer speaking in a voice that was like the shrill singing of fire. It told me the origin of the beast, which belonged to a race of stellar devils that had not visited the earth since the foundering of Atlantis, and it told me the attributes of the beast, which, in its own proper form, was invisible and intangible to men, and could manifest itself only in a fashion supremely abominable. Moreover, it informed me of the one method by which the beast could be banished, if overtaken in a tangible shape. Even to me, the student of darkness, these revelations were a source of horror and surprise. And for many reasons, I deemed the mode of exorcism a doubtful and perilous thing. But the demon had sworn that there was no other way. Musing on these dark matters, I waited among my books and braziers and alembics, for the stars had warned me that my intervention would be required in good time. Toward the end of August, when the great comet was beginning to decline a little, there occurred the lamentable death of Sister Thérèse, 
killed by the beast in her cell at the Benedictine convent in Zimes. On this occasion, the beast was plainly seen by late passers as it ran down the convent wall by moonlight from a window, and others met it in the shadowy streets or watched it climb the city ramparts, running like a monstrous beetle or spider on the sheer stone as it fled from Zimes to regain its hidden lair. To me, following the death of Thérèse, there came privily the town marshal, together with the abbot Théophile, in whose worn features and bowed form I described the ravages of mortal sorrow and horror and humiliation, and the two, albeit with palpable hesitation, begged my advice and assistance in the laying of the beast. You, Monsieur le Chaudronnier, said the marshal, are reputed to know the arcanic arts of sorcery and the spells that summon or dismiss evil demons and other spirits. Therefore, in dealing with this devil, it may be that you shall succeed where all others have failed. Not willingly do we employ you in the matter, since it is not seemly for the church and the law to ally themselves with wizardry, but the need is desperate, lest the demon should take other victims. In return for your aid, we can promise you a goodly reward of gold, and a guarantee of lifelong immunity from all inquisition and prosecution which your doings might otherwise invite. The Bishop of Zimes and the Archbishop of Vion are privy to this offer, which must be kept secret. I ask no reward, I replied, if it be in my power to rid Averroin of this scourge. But you have set me a difficult task and one that is happily attended by strange perils. All assistance that can be given you shall be yours to command, said the marshal. Men at arms shall attend you if need be. Then Théophile, speaking in a low, broken voice, assured me that all doors, including those of the Abbey of Perigon, would be opened at my request, and that everything possible would be done to further the laying of the fiend. I reflected briefly and said, Go now, but send to me an hour before sunset, two men-at-arms mounted, and with a third steed, and let the men be chosen for their valor and discretion, for this very night I shall visit Berigon, where the horror seems to center. Remembering the advice of the gem-imprisoned demon, I made no preparation for the journey, except to place upon my index finger the ring of Ibon, and to arm myself with a small hammer, which I placed at my girdle in lieu of a sword. Then I awaited the set hour, when the men and the horses came to my house, as had been stipulated. The men were stout and tested warriors, clad in chain mail and carrying swords and halberds. I mounted the third horse, a black and spirited mare, and we rode forth from Zimes toward Perigon, taking a direct and little-used way which ran for many miles through the werewolf-haunted forest. My companions were taciturn, speaking only in answer to some question and then briefly. This pleased me, for I knew that they would maintain a discreet silence regarding that which might occur before dawn. Swiftly we rode while the sun sank in a redness as of welling blood among the tall trees, and soon the darkness wove its thickening webs from bough to bough, closing upon us like some inexorable net of evil. Deeper we went, into the brooding woods, and even I, the master of sorceries, trembled a little at the knowledge of all that was abroad in the darkness. Undelayed and unmolested, however, we came to the abbey at late moonrise, when all the monks, except the aged porter, had retired to their dormitory. The abbot, returning at sunset from Zimes, had given word to the porter of our coming, and he would have admitted us, but this, as it happened, was no part of my plan, saying I had reason to believe the beast would re-enter the abbey that very night. I told the porter my intention of waiting outside the walls to intercept it, and merely asked him to accompany us in a tour of the building's exterior, so that he could point out the various rooms. This he did, and during the course of the tour, 
He indicated a certain window in the second story as being that of Théophile's chamber. The window faced the forest, and I remarked the abbot's rashness in leaving it open. This, the porter told me, was his invariable custom, in spite of the oft-repeated demoniac invasions of the monastery. Behind the window we saw the glimmering of a taper, as if the abbot were keeping late vigil. We had committed our horses to the porter's care. After he had conducted us around the abbey and had left us, we returned to the space before Théophile's window and began our long watch in silence. Pale and hollow as the face of a corpse, the moon rose higher, swimming above the somber oaks and pines and pouring a spectral silver on the gray stone of the abbey walls. In the west, the comet flared among the lusterless signs, veiling the lifted sting of the scorpion as it sank. We waited hour by hour in the shortening shadow of a tall oak, where none could see us from the windows. When the moon had passed over, sloping westward, the shadow began to lengthen toward the wall. All was mortally still, and we saw no movement, apart from the slow shifting of the light and shade. Halfway between midnight and dawn, the taper went out in Théophile's cell, as if it had burned to the socket, and thereafter the room remained dark. Unquestioning, with ready weapons, the two men-at-arms companioned me in that vigil. Well they knew the demonian terror which they might face before dawn, but there was no trace of trepidation in their bearing, and knowing much that they could not know, I drew the ring of Ibon from my finger and made ready for that which the demon had directed me to do. The men stood nearer than I to the forest, facing it perpetually according to a strict order that I had given, but nothing stirred in the fretted gloom, and the slow night ebbed, and the skies grew paler as if with morning twilight. Then, an hour before sunrise, when the shadow of the great oak had reached the wall and was climbing toward Théophile's window, there came the thing I had anticipated. Very suddenly it came, and without forewarning of its nearness, a horror of hellish red light, swift as a kindling, wind-blown flame that leapt from the forest gloom and sprang upon us where we stood stiff and weary from our night-long vigil. One of the men-at-arms was borne to the ground, and I saw above him, in a floating redness as of ghostly blood, the black and semi-serpentine form of the beast. A flat and snakish head, without ears or nose, was tearing at the man's armor with sharp, serrate teeth, and I heard the teeth clash and grate on the linked iron. Swiftly I laid the ring of Ibon on a stone I had placed in readiness, and broke the dark jewel with a blow of the hammer that I carried. From the pieces of the lightly shattered gem, the disimprisoned demon rose in the form of a smoky fire, small as a candle flame at first, and greatening like the conflagration of piled faggots, and hissing softly with the voice of fire, and brightening to a wrathful, terrible gold, the demon leapt forward to do battle with the beast, even as it had promised me, in return for its freedom after cycles of captivity. It closed upon the beast with a vengeful flaring, tall as the flame of an auto da fe, and the beast relinquished the man at arms on the ground beneath it and writhed back like a burnt serpent. The body and members of the beast were loathfully convulsed, and they seemed to melt in the manner of wax and to change dimly and horribly beneath the flame, undergoing an incredible metamorphosis, moment by moment like a werewolf that returns from its beasthood. The thing took on the wavering similitude of man. The unclean blackness flowed and swirled, assuming the weft of cloth amid its changes, and becoming the folds of a dark robe and cowl such as are worn by the Benedictines. Then, from the cowl, a face began to peer, and the face, though shadowy and distorted, was that of the abbot Théophile. This prodigy I beheld for an instant, and the men also beheld it. But still the fire-shaped demon assailed the abhorrently transfigured thing, 
and the face melted again into waxy blackness, and a great column of sooty smoke arose, followed by an odor as of burning flesh commingled with some mighty foulness. And out of the volumed smoke, above the hissing of the demon, there came a single cry in the voice of Théophile, but the smoke thickened, hiding both the assailant and that which it assailed, and there was no sound other than the singing of fed fire. At last the sable fumes began to lift, ascending and disappearing amid the boughs, and a dancing golden light, in the shape of a will-o'-the-wisp, went soaring over the dark trees toward the stars. And I knew that the demon of the ring had fulfilled its promise, and had now gone back to those remote and ultra-mundane deeps from which the sorcerer Ibon had drawn it down in Hyperborea to become the captive of the purple gem. The stench of burning passed from the air, together with the mighty foulness, and of that which had been the beast there was no longer any trace, so I knew that the horror born of the red comet had been driven away by the fiery demon. The fallen man-at-arms had risen, unharmed beneath his mail, and he and his fellow stood beside me, saying naught. But I knew that they had seen the changes of the beast, and had divined something of the truth. So while the moon grew gray with the nearness of dawn, I made them swear an awful oath of secrecy, and enjoined them to bear witness to the statement I must make before the monks of Perigon. Then, having settled this matter, so that the good renown of the holy Théophile should suffer no calumny, we aroused the porter. We averred that the beast had come upon us unaware, and had gained the abbot's cell before we could prevent it, and had come forth again, carrying Théophile with its snakish members as if to bear him away to the sunken comet. I had exorcised the unclean devil, which had vanished in a cloud of sulphurous fire and vapor, and, most unluckily, the abbot had been consumed by the fire. His death, I said, was a true martyrdom, and would not be in vain. The beast would no longer plague the country or bedevil Perigon, since the exorcism I had used was infallible. This tale was accepted without question by the brothers who grieved mightily for their good abbot. Indeed, the tale was true enough, for Théophile had been innocent, and was wholly ignorant of the foul change that came upon him nightly in his cell, and the deeds that were done by the beast through his loathfully transfigured body. Each night the thing had come down from the passing comet to assuage its hellish hunger, and being otherwise impalpable and powerless, it had used the abbot for its energumen, molding his flesh in the image of some obscene monster from beyond the stars. It had slain a peasant girl in Santa Zenobie on that night while we waited behind the abbey, but thereafter the beast was seen no more in Everoin, and the murderous deeds were not repeated. In time the comet passed to other heavens, fading slowly and the black terror it had wrought became a varying legend, even as all other bygone things. The abbot Théophile was canonized for his strange martyrdom, and they who read this record in future ages will believe it not, saying that no demon or malign spirit could have prevailed thus upon true holiness. Indeed, it were well that none should believe the story, for thin is the veil betwixt man and the godless deep. The skies are haunted by that which it were madness to know, and strange abominations pass evermore between earth and moon and athwart the galaxies. Unnameable things have come to us in alien horror and will come again, and the evil of the stars is not as the evil of the earth.